In this video, we'll discuss the events that occurred in Texas. On April 4, 2011, Robert Frisbee came to the police station because he couldn't find his 17-year-old daughter, Bridget. Robert thought she spent the night at her friend's place. But when Bridget did not return home, he became worried and tried to contact her by phone. All his attempts were unsuccessful, so Robert went to the police station. Bridget was born on December 17, 1993. There's not much information about the early years of her life because she grew up in an orphanage before Catherine Randall Frisbee and Robert Frisbee adopted her when she was 18 months old. When mentioning Robert and Catherine, I will call them Bridget's father and mother, not her adoptive parents. Bridget grew up to be a cheerful, energetic, and curious girl. She loved poetry, painting, and horseback riding. Unfortunately, the difficulties that followed Bridget like a shadow from birth did not recede as she grew up. When Bridget was six years old, her mother, Catherine Frisbee, died after a long illness. Her death was heartbreaking for both Bridget and her father, Robert Frisbee. Catherine died at 49 years old. Robert tried to do everything possible to make his daughter happy. They had a warm and trusting relationship. But Bridget was getting older, and her rebellious nature sometimes made itself felt. On April 3, 2011, teenagers riding motorcycles in the woods on the outskirts of Katy, Texas, saw something suspicious on the ground among the trees. They decided to stop to take a closer look at what they saw. As they got closer, they found a young woman lying on the ground. It was clear that she was dead and had been lying there for some time. They notified the police of the discovery of the body. The police officers who arrived at the crime scene immediately determined that the place where the teenagers found the young woman was the place of her death. But she didn't have any identification documents with her. The detectives didn't know who she was or how she ended up in the woods. Thus, one of the primary tasks of the detectives was to identify the victim. She looked about 20 years old. When examining the body, the experts saw an entry bullet hole in the back of the victim's head. The bullet went through and through, as evidenced by the exit wound on the forehead. The police found a shell casing for a 9mm pistol next to the body. At that time, the shell casing was the only clue that could help solve this case. When examining the crime scene, investigators noticed another suspicious detail. There was a small hole a few yards from the body. It was evident that someone had removed the topsoil, but it remained unclear whether this had anything to do with the crime. In search of answers, the police started interviewing people who lived near the crime scene area. It was a quiet wooded area, and residents became worried about their safety when they learned about a brutal crime that took place near their homes. The police wanted to find out if they had seen something strange. Perhaps someone saw strangers or unfamiliar cars near their homes. Any clue was important. The officers went from door to door but could not find anyone who saw something unusual. However, one of the locals said that she had heard something strange. The night before, she was with friends in the backyard. At about 2 or 3 a.m., they heard a loud bang, similar to a gunshot. They didn't pay much attention to it or call the police. At the time, this did not cause much concern, but now, after learning about a dead young woman found nearby, it certainly caused concern. Thus, the police had an approximate time of the crime, between 2 and 3 a.m. No other residents have provided any significant information to the police. To solve this case, detectives first needed to identify the victim. In most cases, the perpetrator and the victim know each other. By finding out her name, what she did, who she was friends with, and whether she had any enemies, the police could get on the trail of the criminal. Detectives started reviewing missing person reports, hoping to find someone who matched the description of a young woman they discovered in the woods. But no one matched the description. The next day, April 4, 2011, Robert Frisbee came to the police station. He became worried after hearing the news that the police were investigating the death of a young woman whose identity they had not yet established. Robert couldn't get in touch with his 17-year-old daughter, Bridget. He told detectives that he had last seen his daughter two days ago 
and thought she was spending the night with her friend. He started to worry when she didn't come home. Robert's worst fears were confirmed when the detective showed him photos from the crime scene. He recognized Bridget on them, and this, of course, caused him an unimaginable emotional trauma. Many years ago, he lost his wife, and now he also lost his daughter, whom he loved to the moon and back despite her rebellious nature. The investigators asked him to tell everything about the last time he saw his daughter and the events preceding his visit to the police station. The police now knew the victim's name, which gave them reason to hope they would quickly find the person responsible for Bridget's death. Robert Frisbee testified that he last saw his daughter on April 2, 2011. That day, he bought her a new rave outfit, blue-green faux fur leggings, a skirt, and a top. In the evening, Bridget's friend Kendall Sudo came to them and stayed with them for dinner. Robert drove Bridget and Kendall to a rave party, but it was closed, and they eventually returned home a little after 10 p.m. Kendall's ride was not supposed to pick him up until midnight, so he and Bridget settled in to watch a movie. Bridget was still wearing her new rave outfit when Robert went to bed and set his alarm for midnight. When he woke up, Bridget said that Kendall's ride had not arrived yet. Robert wanted to lock up the house when Kendall left. When Robert got up again at about 3 a.m., he found the back door and the garage door open. The man locked up so Bridget could not sneak back without his knowledge. Then he realized that his cell phone was missing. He had taken away Bridget's phone recently, so he assumed she had taken his when she went out. Robert called his cell phone repeatedly and looked online to track the phone's GPS location. Unable to reach her or determine the phone's location, he gave up, waiting for her to return. The following day, he called several of Bridget's friends, none of whom knew where she was. Later on the evening of April 3rd, he read on the internet about a body found nearby, started to suspect it was Bridget, and, therefore, decided to contact the police. Thus, based on the information received from Robert, investigators had their first potential suspect, Bridget's friend, Kendall Suto. But Robert Frisbee didn't believe Kendall could hurt Bridget. He said that only one person could have personal reasons to harm her, her ex-boyfriend, Jonathan Larson, with whom Bridget had a complicated relationship. Larson became the second potential suspect. Investigators considered Zach Richards, Bridget's boyfriend, to be another suspect. They needed to find out what these three people were doing and where they were at the time of the crime. The first person investigators decided to talk to was Kendall Sudo, a friend of Bridget who was at Frisbee's house and could probably be the last person to see her alive. Kendall had no previous problems with the law, and when the police called him, he agreed to a meeting. During a conversation with detectives, he did not deny that he watched TV with Bridget the night she died. But Kendall allegedly left Frisbee's house shortly after Bridget's father went to bed. He denied having anything to do with Bridget's death, saying they were friends and he had no reason to harm her. The man was ready to provide all necessary assistance to the investigators. He mentioned that when he and Bridget were watching TV, she was upset because of an argument with her ex-boyfriend, Jonathan Larson. They were together for several months, but it was a troubled relationship, and they eventually broke up. Investigators checked Kendall's alibi, and it seemed to be confirmed. Nevertheless, he was not excluded from the list of suspects since there was no clarity in this case yet. Next, the investigators decided to talk to Jonathan Larson, whose name they had already heard from several people. Hoping to catch him off guard, they arrived at his house without warning. However, they were not in for a pleasant surprise. The house was empty. Larson's family, apparently, left the house in a hurry. However, the most surprising thing was what the investigators saw outside. The windows, the front door, and the walls were bullet riddled. As it became known, three weeks before the police visit, someone fired all those bullets at Larson's family house in a drive-by shooting. Since no one received injuries during the shooting, the police department investigating the murders knew nothing about it. When someone bullet riddled the house, the owner contacted the police, but the case remained unsolved. All the police had were shell casings and bullets, but they didn't know who was responsible for it. 
After interviewing the neighbors, the investigators learned that the next day after the drive-by shooting, the Larsons left because they did not feel safe. Now, detectives were trying to figure out if Bridget Frisbee's death and the shooting at her ex-boyfriend's house were somehow connected. Let me remind you that Bridget's body was found on April 3, 2011, and the drive-by shooting occurred three weeks earlier, on March 14. The police started looking for Jonathan Larson because he was considered the main suspect. During the investigation, police also visited the school attended by Bridget Frisbee and Jonathan Larson. The school administration said Jonathan had not been to school for several days. Unable to find Jonathan, they decided to talk to Bridget's classmates. They wanted to know who she was in conflict with, who might wish her harm, and if she had any enemies. One of those the investigators talked to was Alexander Olivieri. He said that he and Bridget were friends and often spent time together. Alexander stated that Jonathan Larson was the only person with a motive to harm Bridget. When the investigators asked Alexander about the last time he saw Bridget, he said they were supposed to meet on the night she died. They agreed to meet at her house and then go to Houston together and pick up Zach Richards, Bridget's boyfriend, from the bus stop. Alexander said he arrived at Frisbee's house with his friend Alan Perez, but Bridget was not there. She was supposed to be waiting for him on the street next to the house, but she was nowhere to be found. Alexander Olivieri said that he and Alan Perez returned to Frisbee's house a few hours later, but Bridget still wasn't there. According to him, it was about 5 a.m. No wonder Bridget wasn't at home. She was already dead by that time. Olivieri said he learned of Bridget's death from a news report. Therefore, after the investigators visited the school, two new names appeared on their list of potential suspects, Alexander Olivieri and Alan Perez. However, what remained unchanged was that the main person of interest in the investigation was Jonathan Larson, Bridget's ex-boyfriend. Detectives discovered that Jonathan's mother did not leave the city after that drive-by shooting. She moved into a friend's apartment for a while. During a conversation with investigators, she said she sent her son to live with relatives in Austin, Texas, after the incident. The woman stated that her son often got into trouble and she was sure their house got bullet riddled because of him. In her opinion, that incident was revenge on her son. She also said Jonathan fought with another guy shortly before the drive-by shooting. She was sure there was some connection between the fight and the shooting at their house. The woman's relationship with her son was far from ideal. She did not know where Jonathan was at the time of Bridget Frisbee's death. She gave the officers the address of her relatives in Austin where she said Jonathan was supposed to be. However, the breakthrough in the case occurred even before the investigators found Jonathan. A lawyer representing the interests of the Perez family came to the police. He said that his client, Alan Perez, has important information about the death of Bridget Frisbee. The investigators already heard the name of Alan Perez when they talked with Bridget's classmate, Alexander Olivieri. The latter then said he came to Frisbee's house with Alan Perez. Now, Alan was ready to provide important information, but only under certain conditions. He was willing to talk about Bridget's death in exchange for an immunity agreement. The authorities needed answers, so they agreed to this condition. Alan Perez said there was a connection between the drive-by shooting at Jonathan Larson's house and the death of Bridget Frisbee. This shooting happened just a week after Jonathan and Bridget broke up. The one who helped Bridget take revenge on Jonathan and who shot at the house was 17-year-old Alexander Olivieri, whom investigators had previously talked to at school. Perez and Olivieri met in high school. They joined the National Guard together, but when Olivieri returned from basic training, he started attending a different school. According to Perez, Bridget was one of the new friends Olivieri made at his new school. Perez testified that Bridget had been bragging about participating in a drive-by shooting with a friend and that Olivieri had later told Perez that he was the shooter. Specifically, Olivieri told Perez that Bridget drove and he shot at her ex-boyfriend's house with his Yugo semi-automatic rifle. Perez testified that Olivieri asked him for a favor on the evening of April 2, 2011. 
Olivieri explained that he wanted to rough up Bridget for telling friends about the drive-by. He wanted Perez there as backup. Olivieri instructed Perez to bring a weapon. Perez brought a 380 caliber pistol and wore his green military uniform, mask, and gloves. Olivieri had his 9mm Beretta pistol in a shoulder holster under his jacket. According to Perez, they went to Olivieri's house after midnight. Olivieri then called Bridget and asked her to ride with him to pick up her boyfriend, Zach Richards, from the bus station. Bridget declined, saying that she was busy. Olivieri decided to go to Bridget's house and told Perez to hide under a blanket in the back of his Suburban. Olivieri told Perez he wanted to get Bridget into his car. That's why Perez had to sit under the covers and keep quiet. After reaching their destination and exiting the vehicle, Perez was supposed to follow them at a distance. Bridget was leaving on her four-wheeler to meet friends when they got to her house, so they left. They set out again to find her a little later and found her pushing her four-wheeler because it had run out of gas. Olivieri asked her to help him dig up a cache of some random thing. She initially said no, but eventually, he talked her into going with him. Bridget put her four-wheeler in the garage and climbed into the passenger seat of Olivieri's Suburban. Perez was still hiding in the back of the vehicle under blankets. Olivieri drove to the same neighborhood where he and Bridget had done the drive-by shooting. They got out of the car. Perez waited a minute and then started following them. Perez saw Olivieri carrying a shovel and leading Bridget with a flashlight. Olivieri pointed out a spot and asked Bridget to start digging. As she bent over to dig, Perez saw Olivieri reach into his jacket, pull out his gun, put it to the back of Bridget's neck, and fire. Perez testified that he was shocked because he thought Olivieri might threaten her, might poke her with the gun, but he had just shot her. Olivieri ran towards Perez. The latter cursed at him for a bit. Olivieri told Perez to shut up and run towards the car while he retrieved his shovel, flashlight, and Bridget's cell phone. Then, they left the crime scene and drove to Perez's house. Before reaching their destination, they smashed Bridget's phone with a shovel and hit it. After this, they drove home to Olivieri. They moved all the things from the Suburban to Alexander's room. According to Perez, he and Olivieri went to pick up Bridget's boyfriend, Zach Richards, at the bus station at about 4 a.m. Perez invited Richards to stay the night at his house, so the three of them drove to Perez's house and went to bed. They didn't tell Richards anything about the crime. Olivieri told Perez that they had to be each other's alibis. When questioned by the police, Perez had to say he stayed at Olivieri's house, hung out, watched a movie, and then they went to pick up Richards together. Alexander Olivieri convinced him they would be in no danger if they said the same thing and provided each other with an alibi. Olivieri also told Perez that he was going to get rid of his gun, with which he took Bridget's life. Bridget was upset that Jonathan Larson, with whom she was in a relationship, had cheated on her. Olivieri offered to take revenge on him by firing at his house. However, he did not expect what would happen next. Bridget did not keep the drive-by shooting a secret, and Olivieri was very worried about it. This incident could put an end to his plans. He wanted to become a military man, but now his dream was hanging by a thread. That's what made him go to extreme lengths to make Bridget quiet. He decided that the only way out of this situation would be the death of Bridget Frisbee. While investigating this case, the police heard the name of Zach Richards, Bridget's boyfriend, several times. Therefore, they decided to talk to him. They wanted to know if Richards would confirm Alan Perez's testimony or if the latter was trying to absolve himself of responsibility. The situation seemed very confusing. Bridget's boyfriend, Richards, testified that in March of 2011, Alexander Olivieri stated that he was going to deal with something, grabbed his AK-47, and left with Bridget in her car. Later, Olivieri told Richards that he had shot at Bridget's ex-boyfriend's house from her car while Bridget drove past. Olivieri told Richards that he participated in the drive-by to do a favor for Bridget and just because he could do it. 
Richards testified that Bridget kept bragging about the shooting and that Olivieri angrily confronted her and told her to stop telling people. On April 3, 2011, Olivieri had agreed to bring Bridget to the Houston bus station to pick up Richards at about 1 a.m. When Olivieri did not show up, Richards got a ride to a Denny's and finally reached Olivieri by phone at about 2.30 or 3 a.m. Olivieri told him he was at home but would come pick him up. Alexander finally arrived several hours late, and Perez was with him. When Richards asked about Bridget, Olivieri said he tried to contact her and went by her house, but she wasn't there. According to Richards, he went to Bridget's house after sleeping for a few hours. Her dad answered the door and said that Bridget had been out all night and that he did not know where she was. Richards tried to locate her through friends over the next couple of days until he heard the news about the discovery of her body. Richards told the investigators that he had previously been in the woods, which have now become a crime scene, with Bridget and Olivieri. According to him, this area was familiar to Olivieri, and there was nothing unusual in Olivieri always having a weapon with him. Thus, everything pointed to the fact that Alexander Olivieri was responsible for the death of Bridget Frisbee. Four days after her death, the police had an arrest warrant for Olivieri. Given that the suspect owned several types of weapons and was good at handling them, the police asked the SWAT team's help to arrest him. After the surveillance team confirmed that Alexander Olivieri was home, the SWAT team started their work. Fortunately, they did not have to use weapons. Olivieri surrendered without resistance. He was calm and showed no emotion. He understood why they arrested him but denied any involvement in the death of Bridget Frisbee. Alexander's father, Samuel Olivieri, consented to the search of the house and car. The police found neither the AK-47 nor the Beretta, but they found an instruction manual for a 9mm Beretta pistol. It matched the shell casing found at the crime scene. In Olivieri's Suburban, police recovered a blanket, a shovel, a rifle, and shotgun shell casings, as well as trace evidence samples, including fibers, from the passenger seat and floorboard. Ballistics testing revealed that the shell casing from the Suburban matched the shell casing recovered from the drive-by shooting at Larson's house. Fibers lifted from the passenger seat of the car matched Bridget's new rave faux fur outfit that she was wearing when her father last saw her on the night of April 2nd. During the trial of Alexander Olivieri, he claimed that he did not see Bridget the night someone took her life. Olivieri's defense argued that fibers found in their client's car, which matched the fibers of Bridget's new rave faux outfit, ended up there a few weeks before her death. But this version has failed. During the trial, Robert Frisbee provided a statement on his credit card, which proved that Bridget's outfit was purchased on April 2, 2011. She died a few hours after that. It indicated that Bridget was definitely in Olivieri's car before her death, which means he was lying when he said he hadn't seen her that night. The court saw a video that appeared on YouTube in 2010, about a year before Bridget's death. It was called, Me and My Beretta 9mm. It shows Alexander Olivieri firing various weapons, including a Beretta pistol. Alan Perez testified at the trial that the video showed the same gun that Olivieri used to take Bridget's life. On August 1, 2012, the court sentenced Alexander Olivieri to 60 years in prison. He will be eligible for parole in 30 years, but Robert Frisbee believes Olivieri will be behind bars for at least 50 years. It's important this man is off the street and he needs to stay off the street for the rest of his life, Robert Frisbee said. Living in a small cell for all those years, he'll be a broken man when he comes out.